Thank you all for coming. Um, so, we been asked to talk about uh, uh, risk stratification P. I'm on the Speaker's Bureau for Actelian and Bayer. So the objectives in this talk is going to be looking at current risk stratification, mainly looking at clinical variables which go into uh, risk stratification, looking at some risk scores and use of imaging modalities, both echo and uh, CT scan and some biomarkers and a combined approach to risk stratification. So you know, why is risk stratification in P so important? I think it's important uh, because it helps us determine prognosis both in hospital mortality and long-term prognosis in terms of whether the patients go on to develop CTEF whether patients are going to have recurrent PE or, you know, and even in terms of predicting all-cause mortality. More importantly, it helps us establish treatment options, whether patient needs to be treated inpatient versus outpatient, or somebody, uh, you know, is a candidate for thrombolysis. So, uh, sort of uh, something to just go over a pathophysiologically, one of the main um, hallmarks of all uh, the risk stratification uh, tools and scores that we have is there uh, is the importance of RV function in determining prognosis of patients. And as you can see here, you know, once patients have PE and have anatomical obstruction and neurohormonal effects in the pulmonary vasculature, it increases the RV afterload, which leads to RV dilatation and dysfunction and leads to increased RV wall stress, and that's what leads to increase in your biomarkers, which is either BNP or troponin. And uh, this leads to increased RV uh, uh, oxygen demand and decreased oxygen reserve, and this leads to all the echocardiographic uh, and uh, CT uh, or other imaging modality signs of RV dysfunction, and eventually leads to decreased cardiac output and <coughs> hypotension. So, you know, that said, I think one thing that uh, everybody you know, taking care of uh, patients with pulmonary embolism can agree upon is that hypotension is bad in these uh, patients with PE. And as it was, you know, shown in this study, you know, patients who had uh, systolic blood pressure under 120, you know, had a, almost a 22 times higher mortality than patients who had a systolic blood pressure over 120. And so, you know, one of the easy things to do in, in I guess, in patients with pulmonary uh, embolism is that if you have suspected acute PE and if you are in shock, you know, then they are definitely at high risk of, you know, not doing well uh, in the next 30 days or even during hospitalization. Um, now, coming to the low-risk patients, I think this in the last 10 years has probably has been fairly well established and also been very well validated. And this goes back to the study in uh, you know, 2005 where they uh, tried to risk stratify patients who could benefit from outpatient treatment when you were diagnosed with PE. And uh, using multivariate analysis, you know, came up with a risk score which had about 11 characteristics. And as one thing you can see here is a lot of these uh, variables are really basic, uh, you know, patient characteristics. You know, not a lot of these really go into, you know, evaluating your RV. There's really no biomarker here. So, um, uh, you know, th th that's what makes risk stratifications in PE so much more uh, I think confusing and also uh, tough because like Eric was saying, you know, if somebody has a malignancy, you know, somebody is 90 years of age and, you know, comes in with a bad PE, uh, their prognosis is not really, you know, going to be limited much by their RV function, but by, probably just by their cl clinical characteristics of having a malignancy or having bad heart failure or having an underlying uh, underlying life-limiting disease, and that's what this kind of goes into here. And uh, uh, so based on the patient characteristics, you could uh, classify them into class one, class two, class three, class four, and class five. And as you can see here, you know, the risk uh, of mortality increases as you go through the class. But uh, the point I want to make here is that what both, you know, uh, PESI score, and we'll subsequently talk about, uh, um, it's not moving. Uh, uh, the SPC score are really geared to doing is to identify those low risk patients who are who can be treated essentially at home. And in a, in a accompanying editorial with the PESI score, it was really well said about you know how home is probably uh, the best place to treat a lot of these conditions. And you know especially with PE, uh, if you're low risk, I, I think they've shown in subsequent studies that these patients who are treated at home you know, uh, had very low mortality in the subsequent one year. 
Now, because of PESI score having almost you know, 11 variables, they came up with uh, an, another simplified PESI score. And I think if, you know, it, if it were to be a cardiologist, maybe they would have called it the SHAB C2 score or something like that, like the CHAD S2, but they called it the simplified uh, PESI. So you know, uh, essentially, it looks at the uh, oxygen saturation less than 90%. Heart rate over 110, age over 85, blood pressure, systolic blood pressure uh, under 100, and presence of either cancer or cardiopulmonary disease. It's f very simple. If you don't have any of this, then you are at really low risk of mortality and you can be treated at home. Whereas if you have any of these, then your uh, risk of mortality you know, uh, can be uh, as high as 10% and you probably uh, you know, need to get admitted. So um, then, you know, going to the intermediate risk patients, I mean, just to recap, you know, we went over the high risk patients. These are patients who've had hypotension. You know, that's easy. And the low risk patients, I think we have a reasonably well-functioning score, which can identify patients who can be treated at home. Uh, but this is the real gray area. You know, when you come to this intermediate risk patients who, uh, you know, who's, uh, I don't know why, it's, uh, who's, who belong to this class two through four of a uh, PESI uh, risk model where their risk of mortality or, you know, is between three and 10%, uh, and, but they are normotensive. So the key really here is to identify a subset of patients who will benefit from an intervention, but without an increased risk of adverse events. And this is where I think, you know, additional data like uh, imaging or biomarker, uh, you know, really plays a role. So going over, you know, uh, imaging studies, I think the thing that we all use uh, very often, like Dr. Mamerian was saying, is, you know, get an echo on these patients. And there have been multiple echocardiographic parameters. I don't have the time to, you know, uh, go through all of them to identify uh, PE, like McConnell sign, you know, the 60-60 sign. Or, but uh, we are really looking at echocardiographic characteristics which predict poor prognosis. And there it's fairly simple. You know, most of the studies have looked at RV to LV ratio um, and, uh, you know, any RV dysfunction. You know, uh, when you're looking at any RV hypokinesis or systolic dysfunction. And about two to three studies have looked at a TR velocity, which gives you a systolic PA pressure of over 40 uh, as uh, one of the, uh, you know, poor uh, prognostic uh, characteristics. Uh, and uh, this is essentially, you know, uh, reiterating the same fact. As you can see here, this is mostly in normotensive patients. If you, you know, were to look at, you know, uh, one through four uh, studies, uh, you know, looking at RV hypokinesis, RV dil dilatation, and RV, uh, one thing we didn't talk about was the RV uh, basilar or the mid dimension over 30 millimeters. Again, it has been shown uh, to be uh, a poor prognostic uh, characteristic uh, in these patients. So again, you know, one of the things that I think has um, yet to um, go into practice is the prognostic signs which have been shown in studies to uh, poorly prognosticate patients have not really been incorporated in a lot of trials. So that's where I think identifying these uh, uh, intermediate risk patients is more, uh, tougher because uh, a lot of the a lot of our treatment trials have not really incorporated a lot a lot of these uh, characteristics. So in uh, the the largest trial of uh, thrombolytics in patients who are at intermediate risk of uh, mortality was the PITO trial, and uh, there they used a right ventricular and diastolic uh, diameter of uh, 30 millimeter uh, and uh, the. Uh, RV to LV uh, and diastolic di uh, diameter of greater than 0.9, hypokinesis of the right ventricular fee wall, and the tricuspid systolic velocity of greater than 2.6 uh, meters per second. So again, this is to reiterate the fact that when you see RV dysfunction, you know, and this is a meta-analysis of about 12 studies, and a lot of these studies were done in normotensive patients. And as you can see here, both in-hospital mortality and 30-day mortality are higher in patients with any RV dysfunction. So with CT and geography is another tool that we can uh, all use, and you know, kind of get two for one here because you really don't have to sometimes even get an echo, so though that's a little bit controversial. Uh, so here, uh, you know, if you use a reconstructed four-chamber view, uh, 
uh, and measure the RV to LV uh, uh, dimension. And if the RV to LV dimension is greater than 0.9, uh, then that is a definite uh, uh, poor prognostic sign. And again, septal shift towards the LV. Now, this is, uh, you know, again, in a lot of the CT studies, they've been shown to be poor prognostic signs, but these signs have really not been incorporated in, 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 a, in a lot of these intermediate risk patients undergoing treatment. So, um, again, even though we know they are uh, poor prognostic signs, now whether you can use these things to treat is still uh, kind of uh, in, in question. Um, and I mean, this again sort of reiterates the fact, and these were, this was a meta-analysis. And as you can see here, the negative predictive value is pretty good of all of these. Now the positive predictive value is not as good. Uh, so if you do not have a RV to LV ratio, which is uh, uh, you know, over one, then you probably are going to do very well. But if you do, then uh, the positive predictive value is limited. Uh, now, switching gears and coming to biomarkers, uh, again, you know, uh, troponins and BNP both have been used. And again, as you can see here, one of the things, the common themes here is that all of these biomarkers have a very good negative predictive value. That means if they're not uh, elevated, then these patients continue to go on and do well. But if they're elevated, the, you know, it, uh, um, it does portend uh, high mortality, as you can see here in the odds ratio. You know, once your anti-pro-BNP or troponin is elevated, they're definitely at higher risk, but uh, they, a lot of their role is really in being able to rule out patients who would, uh, you know, uh, who would continue to do well. So, you know, now coming to this sort of combined approach, this was from the uh, ESC guidelines in 2014. What they did was, you know, they incorporated the PESI score and signs of RV dysfunction on an imaging test and biomarkers. And of course, if all of these in the presence of hypotension, then they are at high risk. I mean, really, honestly, if you have a shock or hypotension, which you know doesn't resolve uh, within f 15 minutes with volume resuscitation, then you're really at high risk. Now, the key of using you know the the PESI class and signs of RV dysfunction is really in this intermediate group. And as you can see here, you know these patients do not have hypotension. However, if you uh, are in PESI class three to four. And if both RV dysfunction and uh, you, your uh, troponin's positive, then you're at this intermediate high uh, risk group. And the intermediate low risk group, you have either one positive with RV dysfunction. Now with low, you, you know, everything is negative. Now how do we use this in clinical practice, I think is still up in, uh, in, uh, you know, in air and, and uh, it still can be questioned. Now what the guidelines recommend is in patients with intermediate high risk, you know, that you could consider thrombolytics if they are not improving. But uh, again, uh, in fact, I was really surprised that with the intermediate low risk group, you know, that, that thrombolysis was actually a class three, uh, uh, which means it's really contraindicated in, in, in these patients. So um, now uh, one other interesting thing which was recently published was actually predicting ICH risk. You know, I think this is very important as we talked about in intermediate risk patients because you're really trying to subselect a group of patients who are going to benefit from thrombolysis but again uh, don't have any adverse events. So they came up with a PECH uh, score which is pre-existing peripheral vascular disease. You get one point if you're elderly you get another point. Previous CVA or previous MI you have uh, you know a few more points and uh, the AUC of this score was very, I mean, uh, moderate at best, but at least I think the field is moving towards this where they're trying to incorporate a risk score for adverse events and for, um, you know, uh, benefit and hopefully combine both of these in determining who may actually benefit from treatment uh, in, in these cohorts of PE patients. So uh, in conclusion, oops, sorry, in conclusion, you know, risk stratification in PE is very, very important, and clinical predictors can determine outpatient therapy. Now, RV failure is a predominant driver of mortality and is an important determinant of risk status, especially in intermediate risk categories. Uh, newer algorithms need to be incorporated uh, in treatment guidelines, incorporating both risk of ICH and uh, uh, hope, uh, uh, success of uh, therapy. Thank you very much.